another episode of the Cardboard Herald, my chance to talk with creative gamers and game creators. And today I'm joined by co-founder of Vorpal Board, James Lang. Welcome to the show, James. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, from New York City all the way to up here in Alaska, you are projecting games over to me. And we just had a sesh where you showed me how to play Gloomhaven digitally, yet physically. It was a, a very strange and actually profound experience. Like <laughs> You must be over the moon with how this thing has come out. Yeah, we are pretty happy. Um, you know, it's funny because it started as just a tool for us to play games. Um, and so we were big Gloomhaven players, zombie side players. Um, I played a lot of co-op games. Um, and I moved away from my gaming crew. And so I was like, well, I'm a software engineer. Maybe I'll try to <laughs> solution my way out of my boredom um and and we've been uh for lack of a better term kind of like beta testing it for about a year on our own time um and yeah we uh we love playing gloomhaven specifically this way it works really really well yeah well why don't we give the audience a baseline here what is vorpal board in, in a way that's even understandable for the the layman so that way they can hear over this podcast or better yet if you're watching this as a video on the youtube channel you might be able to see some of the imagery that we captured during that training sesh but you know give us the the nutshell pitch for what this is so the basic idea is we built a platform that we want to let you play the actual physical game so you're using the real pieces you're using the board you're using the cards um, but then if there's a remote player that wants to join you, you mount a cell phone over the table and then that cell phone will take photos and stream them at very high resolutions to the remote player so that they can see everything that's on the tabletop. Um, and then additionally, we allow the, rem the local player to scan in cards if they need to. So if you're playing a game that requires um, card secrecy or you just want to scan in some of the components so the remote players can use them and move them around. Um, it essentially feels like you're playing kind of an app version of the game for the remote player, but for the local player, you're actually playing the physical game. You're moving around the pieces and all that sort of stuff. So what we tried to do is kind of blend the virtual and the physical um, into uh, a single gaming platform, I guess. Yeah, and I couldn't believe how physical it actually felt because within the system itself, you know, it, it doesn't understand what the cards are. It just understands that they're assets. They can be flipped over. They can be maneuvered. They can grow big or small, and you can enlarge them, like with uh, little windows and previews and that kind of stuff. But you're still manipulating it as though it were a card in your hand. You are the operator. The system isn't really doing anything other than managing a digital table, which like I, I didn't really understand that going into this. And that's the profound part to me is it just felt so real in a way that I, I never would have anticipated going, you know, from a background of almost entire physical gaming uh, in my life when it comes to board games. You know, I was one of those people who's like, yeah, digital board games. Come on, just, you know, give me some first person shooters, some RTSs, you know, don't try to imitate this experience. This is the first time where I've actually felt like I was participating in a tabletop experience virtually in a in a meaningful way. It, it's really something else. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think that was one of the things we've found as well is that um, by its very nature, since it's not a perfect digital representation of of the game, it doesn't feel like these are scanned in, you know, from the factory assets. You know, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like you're playing a video game. You're actually seeing a camera photo of the board, which means you're seeing all the shadows and you're seeing my hand moving over there and you actually see the standees and all that sort of stuff. And for some reason, once you get through the learning of the tool, we find that it kind of lights up the right parts of my brain um, where if I were to play like on my iPad, just like an app version of a board game, it sometimes it kind of feels like a video game to me and I, I don't like it as much. Um, but when we do this, it just since you see the pieces moving uh, and like you said, it doesn't do anything for you. You're having to move all the cards around yourself and trade them and flip them over or whatever. Um, it really does. Um, and I'm biased in saying this, obviously, because I made the thing. <laughs> but um, but uh, but we find that it, it does kind of it's kind of the next best thing to, you know, kind of like sitting actually at the table with people. 
And it's able to facilitate multiple local users, right? Because it's actually on your table. So in theory, you could have a couple people operating stuff on your end. And then if there's one member of your gaming group or a couple members uh, who have gone out, they can dial in remotely. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so it, it has it, one thing we didn't mention, it has video and audio chat. So you actually see the faces of the people you're playing with. Um, but we think that that's um, that might even be one of the most common scenarios, because that's one of the ways we use it a lot. Um, if somebody just can't make it to play with us that night, they can log in this way. Right. So it's not necessarily that they live a thousand miles away, but I do play with some friends that live far away as well. But sometimes just I'm sure everyone who plays board games knows Sometimes like one person can't come. And if you're playing a game that is like Gloomhaven and it's a party based system, uh, just as an example, it, it kind of loses the magic if you don't have the whole party there. Um, and we, we think that, you know, just the way life is sometimes, you know, people have kids or people have jobs. That they can't pull it off. Um, and this, this way they could just be at home sitting on their couch and they could log in on their laptop or on their iPad or whatever. You're enabling a dystopian future in which each <laughs> member of my board game group, which, you know, we live in Juneau, Alaska. This is not a far apart area. You know, everyone is pretty densely packed in a, a small radius. But, you know, in spite of me being able to drive to Dan's house in five minutes, I could be like, yeah, just kind of not feeling it right now. Let's just <laughs> let's just all be at home playing Gloomhaven with one another here. I have thought about that. I have thought about <laughs> uh, that. It just makes it so much easier to be like, I'm not going to get out of my pajamas. Right. I'm going to be. You want me to put here. on pants? Are you kidding right. me? Come right. on. Yep. Let, let's just do this from home. But I will say, I mean, it, uh, if, if, if you're the type of person uh, who when they're playing has like a couple of drinks like I am, it actually sometimes is nice to just say, you know what, I don't want to drive 45 minutes and then not have anything to drink so I can drive all the way home. Um, I can stay at my house. I can have, you know, a bottle of wine with my wife and play code names with my friends um, and not have to worry about like the, the commute part of getting together. I know that that is dystopian. I understand. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, sometimes it is nice to just do it that way. Yeah. No, that, that sounds really awesome. And the the benefit of being able to include those members of your group that move away or live somewhat far apart, the, the use case is, you know, all over the place. Like, I, I'm just thinking about having a, a kid of my own, right? So we have a four-year-old and we were fortunate in that our friends would come over to our house for game night and that works amazingly well. But there are situations where I can't leave the house. My kid is sleeping, so I could play, but I can't leave the house. So being able to be included in especially these campaign games, which like you were saying, you know, it's a party game. You want to have everyone present for every game. And that that is totally a, a perfect example of a use case among several but i do want to get into some of the the technical you know requirements and, and specifications of this thing and really dissect it but at the same time i want to learn more about you man so first off you said that you moved away from your game group so what brought you to new york so I moved. Um, I was in Madison, Wisconsin, where I, I went to school and then I kind of settled there and it looked for a while like my wife and I would stay there uh, forever. But then um, she finished up school. She uh, was completing her Ph.D. there and then got a job at um, at uh, a university here in Albany. I do want to say I'm not in New York City. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to stunt as if I am in New York City. I'm all the way up in Albany. Um, so uh, I'm not in I'm not in cool New York. But um but we and in just kind of the way if you're a professor, you kind of go where the jobs are. It's not, it, you know, it's not a, something that you can just sort of get a job in any city. You kind of go to the university that's offering the positions. So we moved out here um, and then uh, we started having children. I, I feel like you're like Alaska version of me. <laughs> um, I have a six year old and an about to be four year old. And I was a stay at home dad with both of them, actually. So um that is kind of how this thing happened. I had nap times um, when my kids were sleeping for the first few years that I would tinker away um, because I, I'm sure, as you know, as a father of a four year old, you can't really get anything done during nap times. You, you get like an hour and then you're back at it again. So um, I would just sort of sit down and crunch on this a little bit, uh, which is why it took me like four years. <laughs> but, uh, but we got there eventually. Okay, so you were in Madison, Wisconsin. Where'd you grow up? 
Uh, I grew up in the Washington D.C. area in Virginia, um, but right outside of uh, right right outside of D.C. And then um, I went to the university. I studied computer science at the University of Wisconsin. So so that is how I got from D.C. to uh, Wisconsin. Okay, and you're mainly a software engineer. Are you actually working now? Are you still a stay at home dad? Is it primarily Vorpal board is your main gig? What what's up? Um, I was kind of lucky. I I was able to for a couple years now. I was doing uh, just sort of a little bit of software consulting um, on the side. In addition to like my kids are starting to go to school. Um, they're getting to that age, so I have a little bit more time now. Um, but now I'm sort of splitting my time between a little bit of software consulting that I've been able to hold on to, and then um, really ramping up into into this Vorpal board Kickstarter. Um, I'm sure everybody who's out there who's done a Kickstarter knows uh, there's just a ton of preparation um, to get things to kind of a level that that you're ready to put it out in the world. So um, we've been crunching on this for pretty hard um, for about six or seven months, like almost full time. So oh, man, what, what's the current feeling? Like, what are you <laughs> like inside? You are probably excited, a little bit frightened. You you probably are a nervous wreck about did I, you know, dot my eyes and cross my T's on every single possible thing? Like, when is the actual Kickstarter going to happen? And what is the pervasive feeling leading up to it? So the Kickstarter, um, it, it, for when we're recording right now, it's it's uh, it's five, four days away. <laughs> so 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 we launch in four days from when we're recording here. Um, and you know, I think there definitely is excitement because we've been working on this for a really long time. Um, there's not a lot of nervousness around the product because uh, we feel like you know the product is in a really solid state. We've been beta testing it. We've been streaming it live on Twitch. We've been doing lots and lots of stuff with the product itself, with the hardware, all that sort of stuff. There is a lot of nerves amongst the whole team about um, just the marketing and how many people we're actually have reached, have we re- have, that we've actually reached with this thing, and how many people are going to show up on day one. And if you have a bad day one, does that mean you're going to be sunk for the whole campaign? I mean, there's there's a lot of just sort of uh, psychological games about Kickstarters and you, you can spend your whole life reading about people's strategies and all that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, the board game industry is really crowded. So, um, so we're nervous about that. Yeah. Uh, we think we have a weird, compelling product. So we hope, <laughs> we hope it kind of like, it kind of lays on top of all board games, you know, cause you mm-hmm. can play a lot of different games. You can play almost every game in it. Um, so we're hoping that that kind of makes it kind of a, interesting thing across the board but still i mean there's nerves about it yeah um i'd be lying if i said i was like oh this is gonna go great you know um because you just really never know until you put it out there okay so when we're talking about the development of this thing you're making it primarily as a, a tool for you and your friends and you know so that way you can participate in game night with them and when did you have the aha moment that this could be brought to the world. You have the audacity to say, you know what? This thing goes beyond me. I can sell this freaking thing. Uh, it's a good question. So um, it, it started out as as me almost like using my buddies as like guinea pigs, uh, where I said, okay, I got this weird thing. I want to play with you. And it kind of was awful for them at first, because I'm not going <laughs> to lie. The, the first versions of this were bad, right? Because I didn't know what I was doing and I hadn't figured out some of the features yet. But um, what really made me think that maybe we had sort of lightning in the bottle with this idea was when we actually successfully started playing, um, it was Pandemic Legacy. um, And the reason for that is that it was a very popular game. There was no easy way for anybody to do this in any other system that I was aware of. Um, And my buddies actually started having fun. You know, it was was not a we're doing James a favor uh, anymore. It was we're actually interested in playing the game and we feel like um, we're engaged. Like it actually kind of feels like we're playing the game. Um, and so at that point I was like, all right, this could, could have some interest, uh, out there. You know, there's tons and tons and tons of tabletop, you know, board game and and role-playing game players. Uh, and then that's when I started reaching out to some, some friends who knew some of the things that I didn't know how to do, um, and bringing the co my my co-founder Mike on board to kind of help me take this to the next level. Um, and then we kind of like went from there. Uh, and that was about, maybe 18 months ago. Okay, so this whole system, it's dependent on the browser-based software that you have, and so the the host is going to log in and they're going to be able to scan all of the different items into the, the system as needed, and then they'll have 
a camera that's going to be above the board itself. And is there an app that's on the phone that that's the camera or just anything that can plug into your computer, a webcam? You know, what what's the base level requirements that someone's going to have to have in order to use this thing? So at, at the very minimum, you would need to have one smartphone that you would mount over the table. So it is an app running on a smartphone, and that would be an Android or an iOS device. Uh, the reason that it's an app is it actually does some processing of the image on or like right on there on the device itself. Um, and so with that one cell phone, that one app, you could stream lots of different games. Like if you didn't have the need to have cards or secrecy or anything like that, you could play Carcassonne. You actually could play Gloomhaven because uh, you can pre-scan the cards. So once you scan them in in advance, um, you could then stream the board. So you don't need two phones to play a game like Gloomhaven. Where you really need them is if you're playing a game that you're dealing cards out to players during the game. Oh, um, yeah, some, totally, you know, totally. Something like Pandemic, um, you definitely need you need to have that second phone. Games like Root, you would also need a second phone because you're dealing cards out to the other players. If you want to do the second phone, so the secret cards, uh, you would put another cell phone in the card scanning box, which is a laser-cut wooden box um, that kind of is like a desktop scanner. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so you'd have that second phone, same deal. It runs the same app, Android, iOS. Um, and uh, all those devices all connect to each other and connect to the web session that you're logged into. And, uh, and then all the data is sort of sent across the devices that way. This is wild. 2019 is amazing that all of this <laughs> stuff is working all in service so we can have a very physical experience in playing <laughs> yes. our board games. Like yes. this is a monumental human achievement in using all these different devices. You know, we have cameras in our phones that have apps that are communicating with each other and then probably a computer that's your laptop or, you know, some other thing there. And all of this is in service of yo, let's play with some cardboard for a while. I know. Oh, I know. <laughs> that that it, is not awesome. lost that, on me. It is, uh, I think about that a lot. I do. Um, and, and how we're sort of just overcoming a very small hurdle in some cases. But, um, but for people who don't live in the same areas, you know, it's, it, it's something where for me personally, I think about this a lot is that I still see a couple of my friends regularly mm -hmm. that I would not if this thing didn't exist, you know, yeah. like we're still, we still would be friends, but we would talk to each other way, 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 way less. Mm -hmm. Um, this is now a good reason for us to get together and do a video chat session, which like, I don't know about you. That's not something I regularly do with all my friends around the country. Um, and so in addition to being able to play the game, it does get you that face to face time with friends. Um, and that's something that I feel like is like a huge life benefit for me. Um, and I hope will be for other people that they can like, can, you know, stay connected with those people who don't live around them anymore. Yeah, totally. I mean, my, my older brother was my first game partner growing up, right? You know, we played tons of hero quest and then oh, yeah. we ended up doing magic, the gathering and we played all sorts of games with one another, but you know, he and I ended up living in separate cities. We have no connection to one another. So the ability to invite him to play some sort of campaign game, like I, I was just, I recently reviewed Journeys of Middle Earth, the new oh, fantasy yeah. flight game. And I instantly went like, dude, how cool would it be to play this with my brother? Too bad he lives in stupid old Anchorage where we grew <laughs> up and he didn't venture out, you know? He should have left the nest, you know? Whatever. If Brian, if you're listening right now, you, you've, <laughs> you've limited your options in life by staying in the city where we grew up. But anyway, <laughs> how cool would it be if I could play through a campaign with him and through this... I actually think that I could do that. And that that's just an amazing thing. Now with the Kickstarter itself, tell me about the, the backing levels, because when we were talking earlier, you were describing that there's going to be some equipment that is going to be optional so that people are more prepared in order to do some of the shooting beyond just the, the, the app and the uh, hosting service, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so the way that we're structuring the Kickstarter is in two main tiers. And the first tier is going to include an arm for mounting your cell phone to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second tier is going to include the arm 
and the card scanning box. And so the first thing to, to address is like why we'd have those two tiers, you know, like why don't we just always require everything? Um, and I got some feedback. I was originally planning just to have the tier of one for everything, you know, just one way in. Um, but I was talking to some tabletop role playing game players and they were like, you know, we probably could just not have the card scanning box at all. And this would be of great value to us, you know, cause the DM wants to have their map laid out on the table. Um, and they don't want to load all that up into roll 20 uh, or whatever other system. And so then, and also, you know, uh, D and D or whatever other, uh, tabletop role playing game somebody's playing. That's another g- group of people that every once in a while, somebody can't make it. Right. And, th- right, and that's right. when, you know, that's the perfect scenario where the one person just connects in. Um, and then it's just at the DM's house that the actual physical components are there. It lets you use all your terrain and miniatures and all that sort of stuff. So we definitely wanted to have the one tier where it's just, uh, the mounting arm. Uh, the next thing to address is, you know, why are we selling a mounting arm? Um, because there, (laughs) there are other solutions on the market. You know, this isn't, it's not like we invented mounting a a cell phone. Let me take this one. Let me take this one. (laughs) We were talking about this a little bit earlier. So for for those of you at home who have watched any of the reviews that I've done for for any games, you know that I I like using a lot of B-roll. I use a lot of narration, and then I try to have some imagery and video of various things happening. And I actually think a lot about my shots, probably more than I need to. I think about lighting. I think about, is this going to be a handheld shot or is this going to be a camera mounted shot? And oftentimes I want to get a good image from above the game and it is nearly impossible to find a a already manufactured camera mount that is going to do that well, especially with a phone, because I, I shoot a lot of my images with my phone camera. And what I ended up having to do was get a boom mic and then Frankenstein on a, a selfie stick that is like mounted with twist ties so I can get the right maneuverability and everything. And it was the solution that I had to create in order to be able to get these good shots from above a table, which this whole system is dependent upon a good shot overhead from the table. So does that that kind of cover the history of why someone might need something like this? Oh yeah, for sure. And and it's the type of thing where we know that if somebody tries it and has a bad experience, you know, and they're irritated by trying to get the camera all lined up right and and they got to deal with this, piece of junk arm they bought um, because, you know, it's whatever they could find. Um, They might bounce off the system and just never use it again. And And so it was suffer the relentless, you know, shenanigans of all their friends sitting around (laughs) watching them try to set up this camera perfectly. And it's like, oh, geez, Brian, come on, get your stuff together. Right. And the other big thing is that we uh, we could assemble. So we found, you know, a bunch of parts that we were able to put together into kind of a very workable quality solution. And uh, a lot of those parts are available. Um, you, if you look around and buy it, you can buy some stuff on Amazon or whatever. We're not doing anything groundbreaking here. But we we could assemble this for far cheaper than somebody could do themselves because we're sourcing the materials directly from China and, and getting them in large quantities. So so even if even if you wanted to build it yourself, you weren't going to be able to do it as cheaply uh, as we were going to be able to. So we thought, OK, we definitely should include an arm. Um, and so th- that's the arm. The card scanning box is um, it's all aircraft grade uh, laser cut uh, plywood. Um, and it's it's um, there are pictures and stuff that you'll um, maybe I can supply you some pictures to include um, of the box. But essentially it breaks down. It comes apart so and it lays down flat so you can put it away. Um, and, uh, and we tried to design that so it, it has a nice, uh, feel to it and it would seem right at home sitting next to other quality kind of tabletop game components you might have. If you're the type of person who owns, you know, Wormwood gaming components, uh, dice towers and dice trays and stuff, we, we tried to emulate that kind of wood look and feel. Um, so you didn't have kind of like a big hunk of plastic sitting on your table while you were playing. 
for the sophisticated gamer out yes. there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So so what are we looking at as far as pricing? You know, the, this is asking a, a lot on the, the part of someone to even dip their toes into it because they haven't had this experience. And I imagine there's a lot of people who are like, it sounds cool, but, you know, is it going to be really expensive to buy into? And, you know, am I going to have to pay for the service? Am I buying a lot of software? Like, what is the the buy-in for someone who plans on being the alpha gamer of the group, the host, you know, the the DM? Sure. The um, So uh, included in both of the tiers that I mentioned is 12 months of a subscription to the service. There is going to be a service fee. Um, it is going to be $5 a month for the host. Uh, any remote players are free. You can play with as many people as you want. You can play as many games as you want. You can you know, have as many cards in the games you want. There's no other limitations whatsoever. Um, and uh, so included uh, would be that 12 months, um, but we're going to give a reduction in price. Um, so it's not like a full $60. It would be a $50 for the service fee because it's Kickstarter. So you know we want people to back our project. Uh, so tier number one, ARM and 12 months of the subscription is $75. And then tier number two, which is ARM, 12 months of the subscription, and, uh, and the box is $125. So those are our two tiers. Um, and then we have a little bit, of, a couple of like customization options, and we're going to have a lifetime subscription option um, if people are interested in that idea, if they just want to pay once and never, never pay again. Um, but those are going to be the main two entry points that we see. And five bucks a month. Like when you originally told me that I, I hadn't heard, you know, I'm not just doing like a infomercial setups here. Come <laughs> on people. I'm more of a, I'm more integrity than that. Come on. But uh, I did hear the five bucks a month fee beforehand and that alone was really impressive because I, I spend a lot more than five bucks on a Netflix subscription that I use sometimes. I spend a lot more than that on an HBO subscription that I use almost never. I guess Game of Thrones is going on right now, so yeah, I'll use yeah. it for a few weeks and then I'll <laughs> probably continue that subscription and not use it for a while. Um, and then, you know, all kinds of gaming services. Five bucks a month for unlimited amounts of using this tool just that seems really easy and plus that's a lot cheaper than gas if you're the <laughs> right, host right. <laughs> you can just be like doug katie come on pitch in i'm paying yep. for this so if i'm going to be doing all the physical moving and everything here you know you pay up pay up we're going to yep. play some games together i think that it seems totally reasonable and i know that you know again that use case thing you grow up it gets harder and harder to make friends, uh, even for someone as charming and lovely as the two of us. Right. Yep. It becomes more difficult to hold on to those relationships and being able to continue those in a meaningful way through a hobby that we invest a lot of time in and care and bond over. Five bucks doesn't seem that unreasonable, especially with everything that we got to do earlier that really impressed me. Now, I am an old man at this point, and so there is a hesitation anytime someone says scan. And yep. I think that's going to be a big problem for a lot of people going in, going like, dude, am I going to spend like three hours? hours scanning something in advance of a playing session because the word scan sounds like you're putting it on a flatbed scanner and you're waiting forever. I mean, even though you have a phone there, what kind of setup are we looking at for, say, the person who just bought Gloomhaven, they want to play with their brother in Anchorage, and <laughs> so they, they are going to have the maintenance of preparing everything for a two-player game. What are we looking at? Uh, that's a good question. So, so Gloomhaven is a good example um, as kind of a best case for this. So, um, for po folks who haven't played it, you're probably talking about scanning in 15 to 20 items uh, between uh, skill cards and item cards and whatnot. Um, to scan it in, it's it's actually really simple. Uh, you put stuff in the scanner. It scans like once every two or three seconds, probably. Mm -hmm. So if you have all the cards sitting in front of you and you're for the first time working it through and scanning everything in, you're probably looking at, you know, 10 minutes, uh, maybe tops to get it all in there. Um, but then the nice thing is that we do save those games. So let's say you played with your brother and your brother is playing a brute character. And so you scan in all the brute cards. The next time you play, 
all those cards are already available to you inside your app, right? So um, you might have to make some changes. So if, you're, if your brother levels up or maybe gets some new gear or whatever, you'll have to scan in those additional cards. But every time, you're not coming in and having to scan the same 20 cards. Um, so for these types of games, you know, dungeon crawlers where you have gear and whatever, the, the added amount of time is not significant. Um, okay. Well, what about a game where you're flipping a lot of cards? Let's say root, you're drawing cards at the end of every turn from a deck. So am I adding, you know, a, an extra half an hour onto my playtime, an extra hour? Like, what are we looking at? I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that much. It definitely adds time. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say, OK, it's exactly the same as playing at a table. Um, you know, my wife and I play two player root. Um, and, you know, once we get used to using the tools, um, you know, I'd say it probably could add like 10 or 15 more minutes to a game. Um, just, you know, root doesn't have a ton of scanning, especially if you're playing a two player game. You're like scanning one card per player per turn. Um, and then I've played sessions of pandemic legacy, which is a ton of card scanning cause you're scanning multiple, um, uh, cards per turn per player, uh, forbidden Island games like that. Um, and it does, you know, it adds some time because that local player now has some additional responsibilities. Uh, but it's not like we're talking about adding a half hour to a game session. Now, um, in the in the app itself, or I guess in the 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 system, you have a ability to turn cards face down, so that way it's only visible to the player who you've designated that card for. Is there a compromise that you, as the host player, have to make in scanning those cards, or can you make it? fully so in picking up the card in order to deal to someone you're not even revealing what card ended up getting drawn in order to scan it in order to give it to them or are you having to go like well i can actually see what i scanned them but then i flip it over and pretend i never saw it that, that that's a good question because we hadn't actually covered that so um we do maintain secrecy the whole time so if you take a card off the top of the deck you keep it face down you put it in the scanning box, which allows you to keep the card face down because it looks kind of like a desktop scanner again. Um, then right from there, it will appear in the app face down. And then whoever is it was meant for is able to claim it. And when they claim it, only they can see it. So no other remote players can see it. It will appear face down um, for everybody else. And then the way we keep track of that locally, and this It'll bend your bra- it'll it'll bend your brain a little bit at first because um, this is one of the things that we kind of had to engineer a solution to is that when you put the card in the scanning box and scan it the phone I don't know if you heard this when I was scanning cards before but the phone actually talks it it it, it, it announces an ID number so it'll, I, it'll I heard at, that yeah 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 it'll start at one and it'll say one two three as you're scanning cards in and then what we have is just a mat that will be included with the app that has those numbers on it and you put the cards on it face down. So you would put the card on, on position number one on the mat face down. And the reason for that is let's say we're playing root and you are the remote player and you say, Oh James, I want to play my, uh, such and such card, right? right? Well, I need to actually pick that card up and discard it in, in real space, in, in, in reality, not in the virtual space. Right. Um, so right. Right. You tell me the ID. You say, I'm playing card number one or card number five or what have you. And then I pick up card number one or five and then I put it in the discard pile. So that's how we keep track of the cards as they travel uh, between the physical and the virtual and then back to the physical. So um, what that means is a little bit more space on your tabletop just to keep track of uh, remote players' cards. But if they were sitting there, they'd be using that space anyway. So it doesn't really add uh, any sort of difficulty to the local player. Hopefully that made sense. That made tons of sense. Okay, it made cool. so much sense it made dollars. <laughs> There's a dad joke. <laughs> oh, man. oh yeah, yeah. Eesh. I got it bad. Ugh. Okay. Well, well man, this is this is really exciting and I I think that other people are going to be really excited about it and it's one of those things that when you actually see it in action and when you actually get to manipulate things, it, it's so exciting. And as I started off saying, it's actually kind of profound. And so with the Kickstarter right around the corner, is there anything else that you want folks to know about so that way they can be more informed as they're going into this thing? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, the best the best way to stay just up to date on what we're up to is um, we have a newsletter. We're, we're, we, we send it out very infrequently, once a month. <laughs> uh, it, it, we, we don't hound people. Um, but essentially, we send out like development updates, 
um, screenshots and new features, um, all that sort of stuff. So if you're really interested in it, um, that's a good way to, to stay up to sort of the minute on news. You can find that at vorpalboard.com and it's spelled V-O-R-P-A-L. That's how you spell Vorpal. Um, and then the other big thing that we've started doing and we're going to do throughout the entire campaign, because part of what we're trying to do is like be transparent as possible with this, because it, it, it seems kind of like it could be a lie. Uh, right. Like, yeah. I, under- yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. I understand that, too. Right. So when when you see a software application and people and, and, and you tell people, oh, yeah, 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 you're, it's going to work and you're going to be able to play games. You know, at first they kind of look at you like, eh, really? Um, and so what we're doing a lot of is Twitch streaming. We're, we're, we're using the application live. We're actually playing games sitting at my desk here um, and we're doing them with the development team uh, that works on the product. But then also just a lot of my friends. So. <laughs> Um, sometimes they're not the most cohesive streams, uh, because we're, (laughs) you know, you're essentially just watching a bunch of people play board games. Right. But, um, but the, the idea is to show people sort of the breadth of games that we can play on the system and to be uh, realistic about what it means for me. Like you'll see me as the local player, like what, what kind of things I have to do to maintain the game or whatever, because we just want to make sure that if somebody decides one, that people believe that this system works and it does what we say it's going to do. But two, that if they back it and, and they get, they, they know what they're getting themselves into because it, I, I I'm very uncomfortable stating, Oh no, no, no. This is the, this is the easiest thing in the oh, world. Yeah, 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 You're yeah. going to have no yeah. problems. Right. Um, so, so I, that, that, that's the big thing we're going to do during the campaign. We're on Twitch. Uh, our channel name is Vorpal board on Twitch. Um, and we do a combination of streaming our own stuff. And then we bring on game designers to stream their games with us. Um, we kind of thought like, okay, if we can convince the people who are making the games that this works, I will win, you know, like, yep, uh, yep. if we can convince those folks who are, who really understand the mechanics and they like using it, then we think we've, we've really kind of hit a home run. So, so those are the two, those are the two big things. And then the other is just, um, uh, come, come back it. <laughs> yeah. And what's <laughs> yeah. that date again that you're uh, launching? The launch is on, is on Monday, April 22nd, and it will run, um, our end date. We're doing slightly more than 30 days. We're actually ending. So we end on a Sunday, um, cause we didn't want to end kind of weirdly midweek. Uh, so I don't off the top of my head know the day that we end, but it's kind of like late May. So we're running about 30 days, um, and we will be launching, uh, on the 22nd. Well, that's exciting, man. And I can't speak for the, the hosting end of things, but the game that I played, the, the amount that I got to see on the remote end of things, it was really impressive. And so I totally think people should pay attention, go check it out. And then from there, uh, if you want to see some of it actually in action, there's all the streaming stuff. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be throwing this interview up as a video interview and you'll get a whole lot of James and I's very handsome faces talking to one another, but we'll also <laughs> have plenty of B roll of other things from Vorpal board. So James, I am so excited about Vorpal board. I want to check this out and I just want to learn more. I want to get my hands on the hosting end of things. So Thank you for coming on to the show, and I can't wait till we get a chance to talk again. All right, Jack, I appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. Everything all right? Yeah, yeah. My wife and kid must have left to the grocery store, and Uh, he was just barking at them. If you enjoyed this video, we have all kinds of other reviews, interviews, and recommendations via writing, podcasts, and video here on our channel and website, CardboardHerald.com. Our content is audience-supported, so if you want to show your support, please visit our Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Cardboard Herald.